Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 348, Statins, Should You Use Them? BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Moppet and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Moppin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Moppin's office is currently accepting new patients. Under the new guidelines, or the most recent new guidelines for uh, prescribing statins, 40% of adult Americans, male and female, qualify uh, for the for the requirements or for the parameters that have been established. And so a lot of people are on them and more every year. And some doctors have even been quoted as saying, you know what, they just need to put it in the water because uh, everybody would benefit from it. And so we thought that's probably not a, a good way to approach considering taking statins. When, mm-hmm. when statins were first uh, prescribed, they were prescribed for people that had had a heart attack and were at risk of having a second heart attack. And the presumption that was being made is that the cholesterol that those people had was clogging up their arteries and causing the pressure to build within the system and leading to a second a cardiac event. And so they gave them statin drugs to clear up the cholesterol or reduce the amount of cholesterol so that there would be better blood flow and thereby fewer heart attacks. And fewer fewer plaque, fewer plaque formation. Which which clogs the the arteries and veins. Mm -hmm. So then doctors thought, well, heck, if it works for that, maybe it would work to prevent the first heart attack. Mm -hmm. So they started prescribing it just whenever you have high cholesterol. And an awful lot of people have high cholesterol, partly because of the way they eat, some for their genetics, some for their lifestyle. Actually, it's not. Cholesterol isn't really from food that has cholesterol in it. They've now figured it out after all these years. They've now admitted that it has a lot to do with your own liver and what your genetic inheritance. But, But my understanding is you can reduce your cholesterol by changing your diet and exercise. Very little. Oh, exercise, yes. Exercise. Changing your diet, very little. Okay. So, all so right. all those people who said, "I'm so not," hooked that together. I'm not going to eat an egg. Right. Were, were wrong, and they came back out after years of this. I remember in '80s, I was saying, "Go ahead and eat eggs. It's the perfect food." Yeah. I mean, it has balance of lecithin and cholesterol. So, whenever you eat it, if cholesterol did cause a problem, it was balanced with lecithin. So, don't. Give up eggs. So they're back It's the saying, same kind of thing with milk. It's right. bad this year. It's, it's good next year. It's bad the following year. It's good the year after that. When they learn more things or they focus right. on different aspects. And there's nothing wrong with learning more things. They just don't learn them fast enough because we seem to figure it out early on by watching our patients and clinical outcomes and, and studies that we read that are before you get to don't eat eggs or don't eat milk, don't mm-hmm. drink milk, then, I mean, milk products are really not bad for many people. Some some people are intolerant, but milk products are usually a very good thing to eat. There's many types of protein in them that helps us for muscle and brain. And I mean, it's, and, and the fat in it is actually very good. Yeah, I read an article fairly recently where some, uh, an anthropologist, I think, was saying, you know, man, is the only only animal that continues to drink milk throughout its lifetime. That the other just animals drink it when they're babies and they're nursing, and then they move on to other food. But animals. man has a different metabolism. Man doesn't. I mean, like dogs make vitamin D in their liver. We don't. Dogs make vitamin C in their liver. We don't. I mean, mm-hmm. this is. I mean, we make some vitamin D, but probably not enough. And we make it in our skin. They don't. Yeah. So they have fur, so that precludes them from making vitamin D from sunshine. So this is we're different than the animals that we obtain our information from. So I so my first question for someone who is looking at their cholesterol right. and their doctor says your cholesterol meaning total cholesterol is high you need to be on a statin. Right. My first question is why? Why? Because and and does cholesterol high cholesterol or even high LDL mean you're going to have a heart attack. Okay, so cholesterol, there are two kinds. Right. LDL and HDL. Mm-hmm. One's considered good, one's considered bad. Which HDL is which? HDL's the good one. All right. And why, LDL why, is the bad why, one. Why? They say, their studies say, that the higher your HDL is, 
the more it protects you and balances the LDL, the bad one. So if you have a high HDL and your LDL is high, then that's okay. You don't need to correct that. That's not a bad sign. However, there's a formula that takes HDL, the good one, and LDL, the bad one, puts them together in a formula and gives you total cholesterol. So if you have a lot of good cholesterol, right. then- It shouldn't be counted against you. It shouldn't be counted against you, exactly. Right. So when you look at a total cholesterol, many women have high HDLs to protect them. That's one of the things that does protect most women. So when HDL is high and your total is high, forget it. It looks, I mean, your LDLs, your LDL may even be slightly high, but your HDL is protecting you. So you don't need a statin. They did not test heart disease equals cholesterol, elevated cholesterols with women. They only tested men. So that we hadn't planned this, so, uh, but I want to go out <laughs> here. Uh, we had done a podcast uh, a year ago about the new standards for assessing women for heart attack mm -hmm. risk. Is that tied in with the cholesterol? They stuff? haven't figured it out yet. They don't know. They don't, they don't. Okay, because if they 40 have not of done all enough. Americans, that's both male and female, right. are eligible for statins, and they would they would look at a woman and say, "Oh, your cholesterol is high. Let's give you a statin mm -hmm. to prevent your heart attack." That may or may not have anything to do with a woman having a heart attack. Right. So. Okay. So my so first you whenever you look at anything, that's medical, you have to say if the doctor says this is your test you should do blank, mm -hmm. then you have to ask, and he'll probably say, yes, it's related, <laughs> but, sure. but in five years he'll say, oh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> New research. New research, but, but there's research out there that says it's not necessarily related right. to heart disease. So you have, to, like if you have a mammogram and you have a spiculated mass, which is like a little, it looks, spiculated, spiculated means it looks like it has, little spikes coming off of it and oh. they see and it's bright white then that test you have to investigate because it's most likely cancer meaning more than 50 percent chance that, okay. that it's cancer so that test is pretty a equals b so is, is that what a doctor says to, to a patient you most likely have cancer yes. or they say this is a thing that we have to check to see if you have cancer they may say one or the, it doesn't matter. Everybody's got their choice on how they want to say it. Right. But but if someone chooses not to investigate that and not to get a biopsy, right. first you have to wonder about their sanity because sure. it really is a test of <clears throat> a equal a goes to b more than fifty percent of the time. Well, but see that stuff. It may even be more than eighty percent of the time. It's a very, very uh, accurate marker of breast cancer. Yes. So to leave it in and do nothing, not biopsy it, not remove it, is life-threatening. But they used to say the same thing for prostate exams, digital prostate exams. But yeah, but now this they is say, a, don't do them at all. But the dis digital prostate exams did not have the same um, accuracy, rate. accuracy okay. or right. effect um, ever. ever. Yeah. Because digital prostate exams is a it was oh, a, it was I'm by feeling. Guessing by God. I'm yeah. feeling it. I remember it. from a year ago when you I know. had my finger in here that you were this yeah. size. Now, a year later, my memory tells me you're larger because of how I wrote it down. Right. Well, yeah, that depends on your writing it down. It's very, it's, it's very. Um, it's just not as accurate. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, it, it's old school medicine. It, it's old school medicine, but looking at an X-ray that has a speculated mass. There are other kinds of masses that are uh, maybe, maybe not. Different shape. Different shapes, different types. But that type of mass is pathognomonic of breast cancer. So if you don't have breast cancer, that's kind of reportable when you have a speculated mass. Mm -hmm. so, so that's how uh, effective that test is. But cholesterol and heart attacks do not equal. Well... They make the the reason by logic, the deductive reason that they that they still continue to press statins out there mm -hmm. is they say that since we've been giving people statins, death from heart attacks and and second heart attacks in particular have lessened. But there's but lots. The, but that's not. It, it's, it's not, not because it may of be statins. a corollary. It's yeah. not necessarily causative. Right. That's a problem that people make logically all the time. Correlation does not equal causation. Things can happen at the same time. They During can be the last even 30 together. years, we've been making a lot of progress in um, 
defibrillators mm-hmm. and in um, you were saying they have some defibrillators they can implant yeah they implant the defibrillators and if you're if it looks like your heart's going to stop it restarts it just like if you had paddles on somebody so it doesn't feel good you don't want it to happen you yeah. feel terrible afterwards but Neither you're alive yeah <laughs> yeah a heart attack feels terrible good. too but at least if you've had that type of thing usually that's done in people who have arrhythmias Mm-hmm. And they have an arrhythmia. There's several Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, and there's there's some other types of arrhythmias that make you stop beating your heart, mm-hmm. and then it starts it again. But they do it for people who have had heart attacks as well. Right. So so death from heart attack is lessening, but mm-hmm. not necessarily because of the statin drug. Yeah, right. Right. And that's and in my experience with dealing with people who are being treated with testosterone, exercise and a good Mediterranean diet, which is not without cholesterol, um, I find that their cholesterol level doesn't necessarily mean that they've got any plaque on their blood vessels because I send them for the uh, cardiac calcium score, which is a score up to 500 of looking at how much plaque is in your blood vessels and how much plaque uh, is not in your blood vessels. And many of my patients with high cholesterol have had it for years and it got a little better with their testosterone but didn't go down to normal. They have great scores. They're clear. So we did a series of podcasts on blood types and Mm -hmm. diets. Mm -hmm. And when we were doing that, if I remember correctly, you were making the point that eating cholesterol from any source Mm -hmm. doesn't cause you to make cholesterol. That your cholesterol is made not from things you eat, but from things within your body that have to do with your genetics. In other words, I mean, it has to be made from what you eat because everything's made from what you eat. But if you eat a lot of cholesterol, like it doesn't... Like half a dozen eggs. Right. It's not going to pop your cholesterol up. Right. And it's dangerous to have low cholesterol. I have several patients who have low cholesterol, so they have low testosterone. Mm-hmm. So I replace their testosterone, and then I have them eat... I tried having them eat a high cholesterol diet, and it didn't work. <laughs> they didn't make any more cholesterol than they did before, but they felt better because their testosterone was higher. But the, I had to check all of their steroid hormones because every steroid hormone that we have is made out of cholesterol. So you have to have enough cholesterol for your brain to re, to um, repair itself and for for you to make muscle. And I mean, cholesterol is in everything, every cell wall. If you have low cholesterol, it's dangerous and it's it's life threatening. So years ago, when I was in uh, on a debate team in college, we studied logic. And, and ways to formulate logical arguments mm-hmm. and to attack logically formulated Interestingly, arguments. they didn't teach us that in medical school. <laughs> no, I, I, don't think I mean, well, they should spent have. Spent time on it. But there was a uh, there's, there's Latin phrase, reducto ad absurdum. And it means to take somebody's logic, logical conclusion and reduce it by analogy to a single uh, contradictory thing or ridiculous thing on the face of prime right. fasci. Right, right. Uh, and the reason I'm bringing that up is people have an almost an innate desire to reduce complex concepts to simple slogans. That's that's why psychologists will tell you that if you have a bumper sticker or a political slogan, it needs to be seven words or less. If it right. gets over seven words, it gets to be too complicated, too extrapolated, too continuous. So, mm-hmm. so you need a, a pithy little thing. It's so harder we, to write short than it is to write long. Oh. That's what Winston Churchill said, short, pithy <laughs> sentences. Um, but so people innately try to reduce something down to a simple thing that answers all of a cause or all of a problem. So the simple thing is take, take statins, you don't have heart attacks. Right. Now, there are side just... effects that come with statins mm-hmm. that we haven't talked about right. yet. But, but I find, and when we were preparing for this conversation, one of the things that I said to you is I've talked to a lot of baby boomers and older uh, over the last 30 years, who take the illogical to me position of, I don't do medicines. I don't want to take medicines. I don't like medicines because they have side effects or they, they the uh, drug companies are just trying to sell something or whatever it might be. They may be, be right. And so many, they're, that, they're, they may have a, there's some truth a grain the of argument, truth there. But the, the challenge then becomes, how do you make intelligent decisions? You, you take a position, oh, I don't do medicines. I, you know, you, you just want to put my kid on ADD medicine because you want to medicate him and make him some kind of zombie. A, you don't know what ADD medicines do. It's not about it making your kid make a your zombie, kid a zombie at all. 
And B, we're not trying to control your kid. We're trying to teach your kid uh, and give your kid the opportunity to self-control. And to learn. And, and to be able to concentrate and social, enough to learn. And have social yeah. s- skills. And the younger the kid is who's having all of that difficulty, the more he cannot make friends and the more the adults who interact with him start to reject him non-verbally and mm-hmm. distance from him and scour at him and glower at him and give him the messages of his own unacceptability. Mm-hmm. So that really damages self-esteem as they grow into, into puberty and teenage years. doesn't mean their activities are acceptable socially. It just means that they need to control them and they can't. Exactly. It, it, what I used to tell all those kids is, you know what, you're not broken. You just learn or respond differently than other people do mm-hmm. so we have to talk about compensatory strategies mm-hmm. and and there are some and the ways to approach learning and, and things to do differently that then will help you be more successful mm-hmm. but my point today is people want a, a simple argument to a to a complex issue and so the and simple they don't argument, want to take medicine <laughs> well that's what they say but so, so then I say to them, let's consider, they say, we'll, we'll talk about side effects. I don't want to take this medicine because uh, I may get a headache. I don't want to take this medicine because I may grow facial hair. I, I don't want to take this medicine for whatever the reason, uh, because my next door neighbor took this medicine and she's big as a house. I don't want to put on weight. You know? mm-hmm. Well, you can't conclude that that's the reason why she's big mm-hmm. as a house. Uh, so the question you have to ask yourself is if I don't take this medicine, what is the side effect? Right. You know, so maybe I don't want to take testosterone because I heard that it the side effect, I'm a female, and I heard the side effect is I'll get facial hair or I'll lose some of the hair on my head. Mm-hmm. And I say to them, okay. Eh, not then, the hair on your head necessarily. If Go you ahead. do take testosterone, you're less likely to need a walker. You're more likely to be able to have balance and muscle structure that will keep you functioning until you die. You are less likely to have osteoporosis. Mm-hmm. You're less likely to have belly fat. And Alzheimer's. And Alzheimer's. I forgot that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about the relative merits and trade-offs of the choices that you make. Mm -hmm. It's it's emotional economics. Can you afford the cost of your choices? Because every choice you make comes at a cost and pays a dividend, one Mm -hmm. kind or the other. Mm -hmm. So when you're making medical decisions, you want to look at both costs and effect. Mm -hmm. And so you want to say, well, well, doc, if I take this medicine, will I have this side effect? May you, could I have the side effect? Because you, you're never certain you, if someone you know, will have a, a side effect. Distinction. May I have the side effect? Because some yeah, people. There's a, there's a 37% chance you will. You could be one of the ones that have it. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, one of the side effects of statins is that there are many people who are genetically um, unable to take it because it breaks down their muscle mass, Mm -hmm. it can cause lasting damage to the liver in those certain people, and it can actually um, cause kidney damage because it breaks down so much muscle that's going through your kidney that your kidney can't clear it. So should you take it? Uh, If you have those symptoms, the minute you take it, if you start getting uh, muscle mass, uh, muscle pain and muscle mass decrease and inability to exercise like you used to, you should stop it. That's a sign that you might have the genetic, the genetic uh, problem. But there is a genetic test. In fact, that was my issue with my, not my issue with my cardiologist, who's lovely. I just said, I took this test and I've got this gene, which says I shouldn't take statins. Is that the MT? No, MTHFR is completely different. This is a different genetic test. But but I had that test done in a panel of other tests, and I was shocked to see that. But I just didn't want to take statins because I didn't believe that they prevented heart attacks. Right. Or they would have prevented it in me. Well, the reason we... Uh What stimulated us to have this conversation was an article in Everyday Health that was written by Suzanne Robotti, uh, who founded an organization called MedShadow, which does research and publishes articles and documents about the various side effects of Mm -hmm. different medicines. And she says in her article that one of the rare but does happen side effects of taking statins is that you can develop diabetes Mm -hmm. and that you can have liver damage. Yes. Those and, are and those so are those are pretty now those, serious risks. those two are rare. They're, that's what she they're says. Rare, they're rare, but but, they can't but that's them. true. And so you should be followed up after you get your statins mm-hmm. in three months to see a if they're working. B, I mean, if they're lowering your LDL, and B, if your blood sugar went up. I mean, I don't know any guys cardiologists that do that. Mm-hmm. They may check your stat your uh, lipids in six months, 
Most don't check them in three, and nobody checks for diabetes after statins. So that's important. But the, but the number one side effect of taking statins is aches in your muscles, and particularly in your thighs. Yes, big muscles, and and worse yet, breakdown of muscle. Mm -hmm. The last thing you need as you're getting older is breakdown of muscle, more yeah. muscle than. You, we well, have this problem without testosterone. We break down muscles. Rhabdomyolysis. So. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's, that's what they yes. called it. Yes. Rhabdomyolysis. Yeah. Breaking down of muscle mass. Yeah. And that's really dangerous because then you can't move around. I mean, first of all, you hurt. Second of all, you've lost muscle. How do you build it back after you're a certain age and if you don't take testosterone? But so, you maybe didn't have a heart attack. Right. They don't know. They don't know. They don't know. So the the. Takeaway from the conversation is there's there's interesting stuff out there about everything, and you play with the internet or you do more serious research and stay off the internet. Uh, but but the message today is what it consistently is in our health cast, and that is that you need to have time with your physician to discuss medical decision making, and you need to contribute in terms of attention and information that you bring to the table. Uh, you don't just show up and say, give me something, whatever the magic pill is, can I have a panacea and go home? Uh, and you don't let somebody just make decisions for you because you don't want to know the truth or you don't want to know about it or you don't want to take the time. You need to be involved. You need to be an intelligent consumer of your own medical care. You're probably going to have to do some work too. So expect the doctor to do the work, some work and then asking you to do some work. Absolutely. Diet, exercise, changing your habits, something like that because it, it's a it's a team thing. Well, you and have it gets to into both the whole issue of it. compliance. Right. You know, if, if the two of us make a decision about my health and I have a clear understanding that that means I need to do some exercise, am I going to follow through? You am did I it. going to do it? You've done well, it. That, but that's a different thing. Right. I mean, but that's the whole point. Are you going to participate in your own health care or just be a victim of it? Thanks Thank for joining for us. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.